Welcome back to The Forecast brought to you by Headstorm, the show that teaches you how to engineer growth by learning from industry luminaries to provide you with tactical steps you can use tomorrow. Hi, I'm Julian Placino, host of Headstorm Forecast. In today's forecast, we're joined by Craig Markovitz. Craig is an entrepreneur in residence and distinguished service professor of entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon University. Today, he's talking about his journey with Blue Belt Technologies. He's also going to share how a three-year plan turned into a 13-year and ongoing adventure of innovation, tribulations, and excitement. Craig, it's an honor. Let's get started. Welcome to Headstorm Forecast. My name is Pat O'Donnell. I'm a director here at Headstorm. I'm excited to be joined today here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania by Craig Markovitz. Craig, I'm going to uh, embarrass you by reading through your bio here uh, as you sit and join us, but we're really excited to, to ask you some questions. So before we jump in, Craig is an entrepreneur in residence in the Swartz Center for Entrepreneurship and an assistant teaching professor of entrepreneurship in the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. He's a co-founder of Blue Belt Technologies, a spin-off from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, and served as the company's chief executive officer for over three years, over seven years, excuse me. Craig was a key member of the deal team that led to an acquisition by Smith & Nephew in January of 2016 for $275 million. Craig is also the inaugural Prosser Mellon Fellow, uh, where he engages with the Mellon Foundation to explore and invest in breakthrough opportunities to leverage program-related investments. And on top of all of that, Craig is also a member of our Headstorm Board of Advisors. Craig, welcome. Thanks, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to have you. Great to have you. So, Craig, I'd love to dig in. Obviously, there's a lot here to cover in your background, your history as an entrepreneur. But let's start from Blue Belt Technologies. Let's start from, from the entrepreneurship experience that really uh, led to where you are now as a professor and, and kind of was a capstone on a tremendous entrepreneurial experience and, and career. Tell us a little bit about your, your Blue Belt journey. Sure. So, so Blue Belt was a medical robotics company. We licensed technology out of the Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute that was related to smart bone cutting. So essentially, we could incorporate this really cool robotics technology into a surgical drill that removed bone for hip and knee replacement surgery. Mm -hmm. And when we started the company, the technology was really raw. It was basically a PhD student's project. Mm -hmm. And our goal was to bring it out of the university and put some discipline around the commercialization process so we could figure out if this technology that in and of itself, again, super cool, really interesting and fun to play with, right? Does that translate into a product? Does that translate into something that actually satisfies uh, an acute market problem in such a way that people will pay us? Mm -hmm. And that journey took us 13 years. My original plan was three years to get to where we needed to be. But as these things often do, we were met with lots of obstacles and trials and tribulations. And over the course of 13 years, we were actually very successful in building a business that took this early technology, put some discipline around its feature and benefit set, work through regulatory, work through funding, the dynamics of a team and product development, and got the product in the market. And mm -hmm. we're fortunate to, to get to the end zone and, and uh, you know, get an exit with, with the Smith & Effie team yeah. uh, a little over six years ago. Yeah, yeah, very good. And so you mentioned 13 years to, to ultimately a successful outcome. And for those that are familiar with the medical field, especially the medical device field, they're probably shaking their heads and in, in understanding at, at some of the hurdles that can come when you're working in the medical device industry. Tell us a little bit about how you worked through, especially the rigorous regulation and certification processes associated with commercializing healthcare technology. Sure. So, so the challenges around the commercialization of, of medical technologies is, is unique. And there are an awful lot of issues you have to address. And I think we could start at the highest level, which is when you think about a, a technology device like a medical robot that was installed in a hospital that a surgeon would use on a patient, if you think about all the different constituencies across that structure, you have the user of the technology, that's the surgeon, 
mm-hmm. who doesn't pay for the technology. You're mm-hmm. the beneficiary of the technology. Who's the patient? They don't pay for the technology. The payer of our capital equipment was the hospital, the administration and leadership of the hospital. And then we had all the different components around reimbursement and regulatory concerns and the FDA right, mm-hmm. all wrapped into there. So we had to build a plan and strategy that allowed us to prove that our technology was really capable and valuable. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that from a regulatory standpoint, the FDA looks at two factors, safety and efficacy. So we had to prove that this device was safe mm-hmm. to use on patients and that we had to prove that it was effective. In other words, the juice is worth the squeeze, right? The technology, the impact of the technology was meaningful enough mm-hmm. to justify its existence. So that was the hurdle and challenge around FDA and the regulatory you know, issues that you had to, to address there. And before you even talk to someone about what would they buy it, before you even talk to someone about whether what would they use it, Mm -hmm. right? And so there's a lot of moving parts. And the biggest challenge in my experience is trying to sort of triage all these different constituencies and making sure that you address their concerns, making sure that you can articulate the value of your technology Mm -hmm. across all of these different folks, each with different priorities. Mm -hmm. And then you think about the intense capital requirements. Um, we, when you add in grants, non dilutive strategies, traditional fundraising, some debt, some other mechanisms and techniques that we use to fund the business, all in it was probably close to $70 million over the wow. course of 13 years to keep the company moving and to get this technology out. So yeah, lots of moving parts, lots of things to consider. Uh, and in my experience, when you're thinking about medical innovation, understanding all the different constituencies across mm-hmm. the market, across the, all the different touch points of your technology and addressing their concerns mm-hmm. and ensuring that they see extraordinary value in what you're bringing to the table is the right place to start. And then you have to bring all that together and a story that makes sense, that's compelling so you can raise money. Yep. Oh, and then once you do all that, you still have to execute. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of moving parts there for sure. I think it's interesting when you talk about those early stages because something that we speak with our software clients about often is being agile. And getting out, and I know you and I have talked about the concept of a minimum viable product often where you get out the first version of a product that you can to establish that there's value there and then iterate and build upon that. It sounds like by virtue of the regulatory environment, that's not possible in in medical device because it's not like you can take a, a minimum viable product of a surgical tool and test it on a patient and see what happens. So, how do you bridge that gap? How do you get from idea phase into evolving something that then ultimately can be regulated. Sure. Well, first of all, I was always insanely jealous of the software folks because <laughs> here we are building a robot right, and all the different iterations and lead times for the machine shop to build parts and to try new configurations and new sizes. And, and whereas the software folks, they could do some renderings and they could kind of yeah. pro- provide the opportunity to do some simulation. And it's just a different sort of velocity in terms of your turns, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, but it's gotten a lot easier in the hardware space because of rapid prototyping, 3D printers. There's lots of new technologies that have come out since we started Bluebell back in 2003 mm-hmm. that make it a little easier, but still insanely jealous of the software folks. So, <laughs> you know, iterate, go crazy, have a good time getting things out into market, testing customers and ideas because you can make changes very quickly. Yeah. Now, from the perspective of what we did, we were able to incorporate the minimum viable product strategy. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously not with the velocity that a software um, solution can can benefit from our experience, but we can do things like we built early stage prototypes. And mm-hmm. although you're right, you can't test them on patients, you can test them on cadavers, you can test mm-hmm. them on fake bones, you can do animal labs. And so you can even do just some sort of ergonomic studies. And so we mm-hmm. spent an awful lot of time in front of our customers, uh, which we define as the surgeon, right? So we mm-hmm. had this sort of dual strategy around acquiring customer interest and getting validation around the impact, right? We had to have a champion from a usability standpoint. Mm-hmm. So the surgeons had to be interested and engaged and see the value in using the technology. And once we had the actual users of the technology behind us and endorsing what we were doing, then we had the opportunity to go to the administration of the hospital Hmm. and provide a compelling argument that they should pay for it. So although our customer was the hospital, Mm -hmm. right, because they paid for it, the strategy that worked for us was bringing these champions and these actual users of the technology to understand the nuances and endorse what we were doing. So all along the way, we did usability studies, we did trial and error, we did testing, Uh, with our surgeons who are the users to improve the efficiency of the device, to change the procedure and the approach, right? To Mm -hmm. leverage what surgeons were comfortable with and what created more effective and efficient procedures and ultimately could impact the outcomes for patients. Mm Because ultimately that's what we're trying to do, right? 
So it's a different lens to think about minimum viable product, but the, the general principle, whether it's hardware, software, whether you have to deal with regulatory concerns or not, is this idea of you know, continue to test your solution in front of customers, mm-hmm. right? make improvements based on their feedback because their priorities and the problems you're solving for them, that's really all that matters. Yep. Because ultimately you need to craft this perfect solution that solves an acute problem or challenge for a customer in such a way they'll pay you for it. Mm-hmm. And that was our general philosophy. So it was a little more difficult, uh, certainly not quite as fast as it would be if it were purely a software solution. Sure. But we absolutely built early prototypes, mm-hmm. tested them, brought surgeons in, voiced a customer, made changes to the hardware configurations, the speed, the interface, everything Mm -hmm. based on what our customers priorities Mm -hmm. were Mm -hmm. yeah it almost sounds like you hacked the value chain a little bit in that again those working in healthcare understand the complexities of selling in that healthcare environment but it sounds like by being able to talk to the end customer being the surgeon first it made it easier to make your case to administrators who are ultimately the ones writing the check yeah and you're absolutely right and so one of our early sales so it took a while for us to get from this very early stage technology that was built in a basement lab at Carnegie Mellon University to something that you could actually put in front of a potential customer. But we worked through that and lots of trials and tribulations. And just a quick shout out to the people of Blue Belt, Mm -hmm. which was the name of the company. The only reason that we survived over those 13 years and ultimately were successful was because of the tremendous talent, commitment, camaraderie that was built culturally within the organization that allowed us to survive and move forward for 13 years. So we had these amazing people that were just doubling down and working really, really hard on creating a solution, right? Making this technology as good as it could be. Yeah. But when we got to that point that we could actually sell something, uh, one of our early sales, we got to a hospital and the leadership of the hospital, they were really excited about this technology. It is, was super cool. Like mm-hmm. You could actually create very complex shapes and bone without using any kind of guides, without doing any freehand cutting. It was, it, it was I just, I wish I had a video to show the, the, the audience. It's just amazing technology. Um, and so we got hospital administrators and leaders really excited about it. And they bought one. Hmm. And we were like, well, this is, this is cool. Like we could just go to these people and explain how they can make money and how it's really impactful to their orthopedic service line and they'll buy them. And it failed hmm. because we brought the technology, we brought it in and then we had to find someone to use it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And it didn't work because none of the surgeons were inclined to jump in and be supportive. We ultimately had to pull the system. It was one of the only systems we ever had to pull. This is very, very early on in our process. Hmm. Uh, and so we learned our lesson, the way to approach customers, the way to be successful in our installations and to increase utilization mm-hmm. was to work with the surgeons and, and partnership with the hospital leadership and the administration. So mm-hmm. selling it just for the sake of selling it right, was a fail Yeah, because we didn't have that champion that was actually going to use it. Yeah. Right? It becomes a half a million dollar coat hanger in the corner of a, of a hospital, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's like my Peloton sitting at home. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh-huh. You hang your laundry on it. That's right. Yeah, there you go. That's right. 13 years of trials and tribulations. That's a lot of punches along the way. Craig took every punch and somehow, at least from my point of view, understood them for what they were learning experiences. Each gave him a black eye, but also key insights into consumers users, regulatory bodies, software guys, robotics, and more. Wow, that sort of segues us into our next segment as we talk about the value of failure, the advantages of innovation, and why hunting the next blue whale might make an Ahab out of you. I think it's interesting as as you talk about that exploration process. A lot of times when we hear entrepreneurial stories, we hear them and we say, oh, that's brilliant. You went and talked to the surgeons instead of just going directly to the hospital administrators. But in reality, that was born out of a failure and you were able to evolve and and learn that over time. Tell me a little bit more about how failure played a role in your your growth and development of the product and and the company itself. Sure. So failure is a topic I'm very comfortable with because I have a lot of familiarity and experience with failure. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't take a three-year plan to build a business and turn it into 13 years without failing all on the way, right? The, The key is to not fail catastrophically, right? Mm-hmm. Is to take those learnings and, 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 and re-engineer yourself, right? And come out with a solution that's better based on what you learn. So, so failure is, is actually really an important component to being an innovator and being an entrepreneur. Yeah. If you're not failing in some capacity, then some would argue that you're not pushing hard enough, right? Mm-hmm. The, the folks that really can create disruptive innovations that can change industries and change directions of markets right? mm-hmm. are not afraid to fail. Mm-hmm. And the organizations that we think about that are household names that are known for innovation, 
they have a very high tolerance for failure culturally within the organization. Mm -hmm. It's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. And we failed in our funding strategies. We failed in our initial market entry strategies. We failed in our procedure and approach and how we would use the technology. We failed in some of our early specifications for what this product was going to look like. Mm -hmm. But we learned all along the way. And so I think that you know, the lesson learned is to be an innovator, right? you have to be prepared to fail. And you have to learn from that failure. And, and I think most importantly, the takeaway is you just can't take it personally. Yeah. Right? You can't dig in. You can't be stubborn. Right. Yeah. The whole point of getting out and talking to customers, the whole point of trying new things right, is to get true and unfiltered feedback on whether you've created something that's valuable. Yep. And so be prepared to hear things that you don't necessarily want to hear. Mm -hmm. But that's how you create viable solutions. Right. So mm -hmm. you cannot take it personally. You cannot burn any bridges. If someone tells you something that they don't like, you know, appreciate their opinion and perspective, whether you agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. And have an opportunity to circle back and continue to sort of build that network. You know, another yeah. critical component to being an innovator, to coming up with new solutions and creating value in new markets is having a very robust network. Mm -hmm. Right. And and there's two ways to sort of build a network right, in your skills as a networker. And that's one is a resource networker where you're trying to find introductions to people, customers and leads and employees. And the other is idea networking mm -hmm. where you're actually talking to people and trying to understand where new ideas and innovations come from and get feedback on your ideas and innovation, right? So yeah. the power of networking, right? The ability to, to filter uh, the feedback, good, bad, and ugly, right? Mm -hmm. Not take it personally and mm -hmm. use that as a mechanism to continue to improve what you're working on um, is all part of this process to create new, interesting, disruptive innovations and get them into the market. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that startups have an inherent advantage in innovation? because of their failure tolerance because at big corporations it's harder to put your job on the line or put your advancement on the line by taking a risk with something that that could fail sure so, well in some cases yes in some cases no mm -hmm. it, it's hard to sort of i don't want to make absolute statements across the board mm -hmm. in general startups have have you know less bureaucracy less sort of entrenched policies and procedures and they have an opportunity to be a little more nimble mm -hmm. and to proceed through trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that from a corporate side, when you think about innovation, uh, everyone's shooting for sort of that holy grail, right? That blue ocean, right? That mm -hmm. disruptive innovation. But innovation means lots of different things to lots of different people. Mm -hmm. Do you think incremental innovation, right? You can make changes to improve efficiencies, to improve the customer experience, to create new features or directions for existing products and services. And all of those represent innovations that mm -hmm. aren't necessarily less valuable or less important than those seminal changes to markets, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think we can look at it as a continuum and say, you know, when you're, you know, the stakes are higher in a startup, Mm -hmm. you know, when you risk and when you fail, it could be catastrophic for the organization and you have to have that intestinal fortitude and support of your investors and your board and your culture and your organization to press on right, mm -hmm. and be persistent, which is so important because very few companies come out of the gate with a plan and a budget and a timing yeah. plan that are right. Like every one of them is wrong in some measure. Yeah. And you have to be prepared to, to, to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then as you, know, you work through that continuum of risk and impact, Large organizations are absolutely you know, subject to you know, the same trials and tribulations. But I think in, to a certain extent, the stakes can be smaller, right? You don't have yeah. to bet your career on every new idea or innovation. Sure, sure. But the hope is ultimately that your organization supports you one way or the other, right? I mean, that's yeah. you really want leadership and the culture of the organization to encourage people to take risks, to try new things, mm -hmm. because that's where the value comes from. Yep. Yep. Creating a culture of of failure tolerance and, and acceptance of, of innovation, essentially. 100%. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Failure, although it might seem a bit strange, plays a huge role in a company's journey. Sometimes it's even more important than success. And why is that? Well, studies have actually shown that we learn more from a failure than a success. It seems that evolution has sort of coded that into our DNA. To fail meant way back when our ancestors roamed the plains, to die. Our mind developed a survival mechanism due to that. When we experience failure, or when someone close experiences it, we learn and incorporate the lessons into our lives. The key is not to fail catastrophically and always come out of it with a lesson. In our next section, we'll discuss why folks are choosing their own destiny, the impact of new innovations, and the opportunities knocking at our doors. Well, skipping ahead a little bit to to your current uh, role and, and one of your current uh, responsibilities as a professor at 
Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I actually had the benefit of being one of your students uh, not too long ago at the, at the Tepper School. Yeah, I can't remember your grade. We'll have to go back and look and see. Uh, I don't think so. Did. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's just say, yeah, we, I think uh, there were some some moments where I may have uh, underperformed in certain areas. Yeah, you areas. got through it. So yeah, I did. I did. Um, being a, a professor at a university, a research university like Carnegie Mellon University, you get exposure to the latest in innovation, whether it's innovative business models or technologies, especially AI, ML, robotics. Tell me a little bit about what you're seeing in the market today. What are some innovations that really impress you, some technologies that you're really excited about? Sure. So at Carnegie Mellon, there, there's a bias towards sort of tech heavy uh, it, developments, new ideas and innovations. Uh, mm -hmm. But we see lots of different approaches to problem solving um, from a variety of different perspectives. So we have that sort of hardcore, you know, big foundation in robotics, right? Whether it's industrial robotics or autonomous driving, or, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a lot of things kind of cooking in agriculture and warehousing. And so we have so much new idea and, and innovation being developed directly through the university, through our alumni base and through our folks that are affiliated with all the different departments and groups that are innovating in and around Carnegie Mellon. And so what's really interesting and what I think the university has done a great job with is sort of thinking through this idea of, you know, a university typically is conducting research, right, for the betterment of society, right? It's research mm -hmm. for research sake, right? You know, you don't want to bias priorities, direction, results, deployment of resources within an institution like Carnegie Mellon, right? Mm -hmm. Research is for um, you know, the, the, again, the betterment of mankind for the intellectual ev evolution of society. Yeah. But you do have these pockets of innovation that represents new ideas and opportunities that have a path to market. Right? Mm -hmm. And what Carnegie Mellon does a great job with is thinking about all these different innovations, whether it's you know, hardware driven robotics, artificial intelligence. Uh, we've got a lot of sort of kind of new ideas and innovations around financial technologies and, mm -hmm. and investment and analysis and a lot of societal things. We've, we're working hard on on areas around health and well-being and mental health stabilities and, mm -hmm. and trying to bridge gaps in and around sort of education inequality. So there's so many different areas of society and of industry that are touched by the research and the amazing folks that are in and out of Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Uh, and as I was saying, that, that what the university does a really nice job is, is you think about the yield, right? So we have this mm -hmm. population of hundreds of millions of dollars of research and, mm -hmm. and dozens of organizations and, and big companies, household names that affiliate with our various departments and want to work with our people. Yeah. Um, and so we get that lift in society around that piece. And then the areas that represent value into the marketplace are extracted and there's a path to market, whether it's through the tech transfer and commercialization process, whether it's through corporate sponsorships, whether it's just through serendipity around alumni relationships. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's really exciting. I get to work with seasoned researchers and entrepreneurs who have been there, done that, right? Yeah. And sort of understand what's next, all the way down to young, the next generation of entrepreneurs that really are trying to create something that's interesting and valuable, mm -hmm. uh, but really don't know or understand the methodologies and approaches that could help put them in the best opportunity to be successful mm -hmm. and I get to jump in and help them. So long winded answer to your question, it's Carnegie Mellon is, is an epicenter for new ideas and innovation yeah. and it ranges across the board. You know, we're known for that sort of tech heavy AI, computer science, robotics piece. But when you take a little deeper dive into what's going on across campus, we touch so many different areas. There's an entrepreneurial program in the College of Fine Arts. Mm -hmm. There's entrepreneurial programs in various places around campus yeah. where people are working on new ideas. So it's just, it's really vibrant and, and a fun place to meet people and look at cool stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously biased, but I think it's the most fun thing in the world to sit in the sports center and listen to uh, all kinds of crazy ideas become reality and folks raising money and being successful as, as entrepreneurs. That that just sounds like a dream job. That sounds like a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. And then, interestingly too, that that's one piece, but then the ones that don't make it, right? The things that can't get yeah. off the ground. And then you see what people do with that, right? They yeah. take that experience and they turn it in. Some people get turned off and they just like, I can't do this. They go <laughs> and they, you know, get a consulting job or whatever, sure. right? But some people use that as a, as a mechanism, as a springboard to continue to, to push the envelope and try new things. So mm -hmm. uh, reactions, to, that people have to the different circumstances are really telling um, and make it interesting as well. Just yeah. the personalities, the people, the approach. Uh, it's, it's a really vibrant, diverse place to hang around and, and yeah. again, look at cool stuff. Really fun. Yeah. Really fun. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you see in entrepreneurs today that may be different than 
five years ago or, or even two years ago, pre-pandemic, it, it seems like everyone has the be your own boss, be an entrepreneur type mindset these days. Does that reflect in the the types of entrepreneurs that, that you spend time with? So, absolutely. So, so the world has just been turned upside down over the last mm-hmm. couple of years. And, and there's a lot of studies that have, have shown that more and more people are striking out on their own, whether it's full-time, mm-hmm. part-time, whether it's you know, a side hustle, whether it's whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so people do have this, this idea that being in charge of their own destiny removes some of the risk and constraints that we've all had to deal with over the mm-hmm. course of the last couple of years. And mm-hmm. so, so we've seen folks that are, are, are a lot more interested in just trying to understand the process. Uh, but it's just, it can be scary, right? It is hard mm-hmm. to think about you know, giving up your job and that paycheck and the benefits or um, you know, kind of starting off on something where you're building it from scratch or you're inheriting something perhaps that is underperforming. And so, um, you know, I have definitely seen a sea change in, in how people approach the idea of entrepreneurship and being an innovator and, and being in charge of their own destiny. Mm-hmm. Um, but the principles are really the same, right, it, it, in terms of you know, how do you approach it? Uh, and, and how do you kind of put yourself in the best position to, to execute? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see how much of this sustains once the world gets back to normal, yeah. hopefully sooner than later. Yeah. But I think that we're going to see some some of these changes. They are here to stay. I think people are going to start to think about you know, breaking down walls around sort of traditional definitions of work, traditional definitions of how to deliver products and services, mm-hmm. right? And you know, I see it now in a lot of the things that I do, right? It used to be, you know, we had a lot of students that would get into consulting and product management project management and a big component of that work was traveling to different sites Mm -hmm. and now folks are obviously using zoom and other sort of online mechanisms to interact and i think you're going to see changes or i think you're going to see as an entrepreneur instead of having to travel to make uh, investment calls or pitch investors or to go to a conference you'll be able to do so many more things efficiently from your home office and be able to build that and leverage it and reduce cost you know you know reduce time um, and give mm-hmm. you that opportunity to really make your mark. How do you think that impacts fundraising for startups? It, it, you know, being here in Pittsburgh, there's been conversations around the amount of available capital here in the Midwest or the Rust Belt, depending on how you define where where Pittsburgh is. Yeah. Now with Zoom calls, you're able to hop on and and be on the line with with a fund in Silicon Valley uh, instantaneously. Have you heard or seen changes in the way that capital is raised uh, among some of the the companies that, that you've worked with? So I, I haven't seen it stick yet. So so mm-hmm. the old adage was you know you needed to be within a short distance of your investors because they don't want to travel. So if you have an investor that's based in Silicon Valley, they're going to invest in companies that are a reasonable driver, reasonable travel time so they sure. can attend board meetings and work with their portfolio companies. And it makes it harder on them to manage their portfolios and try to help them if it's spread out all, all around the country. And so theoretically, right, you can start to see some some walls break down mm-hmm. uh, and some companies that perhaps would not be on the radar of particular investors get on that radar because of technology. And, and you know, I, I haven't seen a whole ton of that. I think theoretically it, it could work and we'll have mm-hmm. to wait and see what happens in terms of funding announcements and sort of how portfolios are built by professional investors to see if they're more disparate now in terms of how they build their portfolios. Yeah. But it opens up the conversation, right? It allows you to do things like, you know, some of the accelerator programs, whereas you would have to be, you know, the original Y Combinator in Silicon Valley, you'd have to be there in resident. They mm-hmm. ran some cohorts where you could, you, know, you had more flexibility on location. And so I think it, it is going to sort of make the world smaller. Mm-hmm. And, and provide folks with the opportunity to talk to investors. I also think it's going to open up some international opportunities for people from an investment supplier and customer standpoint. Mm, that's interesting. That perhaps they wouldn't have seen before. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think at the end of the day, Pat, we're going to see changes and we're going to see some of those sort of bright lines dim and, and mm-hmm. more crossover. Uh, it remains to be seen as to whether or not it's sort of meaningful and, and, and how much of an impact it's going to have in the long term. Yeah. We'll wait and see. Yeah. Really interesting. Really good points on, especially being able to operate your business more broadly, finding customers internationally and and the like. Really interesting. The world has been turned upside down and that change is commutative. There's no stopping it. Like a snowball rushing down a hill, it's only getting bigger. The impact of innovation, new fundraising techniques, and the change in today's entrepreneurs is still uncertain. Nevertheless, it is something we have to process incorporate into our pipelines and meet head on. The forecast's next segment will give you the inside scoop on how to bring a concept to life as a minimal viable product. So as you all know, on the product bow tie, uh, we have five phases, right? So you start with your idea, your campaign, if you will, 
Uh, you validate it by talking to as many people, understanding the size of the market, uh, and, and you know, ultimately iterating on your ideas as you talk to more people. And then you do a POC or MVP. So ultimately, once you validate it, you build, you scale, and, and you bring your product to market. So I'm hoping to get three inputs here, one each on what's a wireframe, what's a proof of concept, and what's an MVP. Can, can someone give me uh, a definition for each of the three of those? I'll do it. <laughs> a wireframe is just like a rough outline of pages. It can be done in pencil. In fact, it's almost easier and faster that way. But it's just like a what the screen might look like, areas of controls and inputs and stuff. A proof of concept is kind of an end-to-end -end proof of that your core main uh, idea works of like we've got an environment stood up that supports this kind of usually you're solving for one or two major use cases um, and then that works and that you've proved that technically it's capable and then an MVP is a more fleshed out version of a POC that is like we can take this to market and sell it it doesn't have to have all the features but it's usually our beta or version one kind of a thing awesome yeah Peter that's great and, and we'll dig into uh, each of those a little bit more specifically but uh, that that you hit the nail on the head um, just a quick anecdote on what you see on the left side of the screen there. That is the Nikola uh, electronic pickup truck. Uh, their proof of concept was to roll it down a really long, slightly gradual hill and tell everyone that it's a fully autonomous driving truck. So perfect example of a POC. Don't recommend uh, replicating their approach. So to talk about wireframes proof of concept and minimum viable products in action. Let's use a case study. We're going to look at Clay's Hair Care Fair. And so let's start with wireframes. And so as Peter said, a wireframe is really the quickest iteration that you can take on a very simple view of the product that you want to build, right? So Clay's Hair Care Fair is an online marketplace that sells hair products. And, you know, ultimately we know we think it want to be a, we want it to be a mobile app. We think we want it to be maybe a web platform. Um, but first things first, our core tenets is that we're going to be selling hair products. So how can we use a really quick and easy tool or platform to get the basics on what we're trying to build? In this case, these are simple wireframes built in Miro. You see, I used emojis and that's not facetious. Like literally when you're building a wireframe, use emojis, use simple gray boxes, make it white background. Don't worry about designing it at all. Just do enough to get the very basics of it so that you, the product person, can speak to what you're trying to build. Now, in each of these three phases of wireframe POC MVP, it's incredibly important to get feedback, right? And so you can get feedback in a lot of different ways, and, and we'll talk about that at the end. But... When you're getting feedback, be sure to communicate to the people that you're talking to that, hey, this is a wireframe. This is a really early concept. This isn't what it's going to look like, but here's the value prop, right? And so at that wireframe phase, you want to focus on what's the problem we're solving and what's the value that we provide that solves that problem. And once you validated that, you can move on. And so then we move on to a proof of concept. And again, as, as Peter said, a proof of concept is not meant to be your final product but it is a workable solution that helps you to better validate the market of what you're trying to build. So in this case, Clay has set up a little Etsy shop where he's selling hair products, right? So he's got his nice little headshot there. Everyone can see, hey, we're gonna trust this guy. He's an expert on hair. And then he's selling products here. Notice an Etsy shop doesn't require software engineering. It doesn't require you setting up a distribution center. It doesn't require you doing really any of the things that it takes to start a business. All it does is give you a platform where you can get feedback in real time and out in the market. Again, at this phase, we wanna iterate, we wanna interview, we wanna to talk to folks and understand how are they receiving the product? Is this something that's valuable for, to them? Um, how do we compare against other competitors and other people playing in that market? Those are all things that you can suss out with a proof of concept. And then finally getting to MVP, kind of the last stage of our, of our build and validation, uh, kind of middle of the product bow tie. An MVP, again, Peter hit this nail on the head. An MVP is the least set of features that you can build to full fidelity in order to demonstrate the value of your product to solve a problem, right? And so you can build an MVP in a lot of different ways. A lot of times it's best built as a shallow front-end application. 
Um, you don't build necessarily this massive architecture and infrastructure, but just the UI to be able to communicate to the users, hey, here's exactly um, what we're trying to do. And this is when your interview and iterate can really take off because you can release your product using something, a tool like test flight, right? Where you can get your solution out into the public or, or semi-public into the private um, to get real live users and real live feedback on your product. So again, the emphasis on MVP, it is a sliver of the functionality, the most valuable sliver of the functionality that shows what you're creating. Um, you know, as a part of the product process, you'll build, build an effort versus value matrix. This is that top right corner in effort versus value. Thanks as always for tuning in to the forecast brought to you by Headstorm. As part of this vast community, we hope these tips and insights will make a difference. Future-proof your business, your mindset, and help you surpass your expectations. Feel free to reach out. Our contact info is in the description. Hope to see you next time as the forecast brings you more thoughts from industry leaders and strategies to engineer growth.